Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and sorry for the delay. I'm going from broadcast to broadcast this evening, and it's pretty crazy, okay? So it's been a pretty crazy night, evening, ladies, and ladies and gentlemen. Oh, and my goodness, the there I am I'm again, and I need to go ahead and mute that so you don't hear me twice, right? Okay, so with that, I want to go ahead and make a few things clear for y'all, okay? So I'm going to be broadcasting till, uh, you know, almost uh, 10 o'clock, you know, to just before, just before 10 o'clock, and I've got... Uh, what I'm doing, and I'm doing the same thing tomorrow night, um, that I am, let me see, um, yeah, let me just run it, run in here. I just need to run and get something real quick. Okay. But I'm here. Okay. So at eight o'clock AM, uh, tonight and tomorrow, not eight AM, eight, eight, eight AM for, for sleeping, right? Unless you're in class, then if you're in Euro, you should stay awake. Right. So as far as that goes at 8 PM, and this is tomorrow night as well, I'm broadcasting with Fiveable. If you want to look into Fiveable plus that's fiveable.me slash plus. Okay. Fiveable.me slash plus. And that session is from eight to nine. We had one to night from eight to nine, then we've got that tomorrow. I'm going to be broadcasting here till just about 10 o'clock. And then I'm going to be leading an AP Euro salon review. It's a small group premium review. My, I'm capping it at 25 people. We've currently got 18 signed up. So there are seven more spots for the salon review. And this is basically creating a small group classroom setting. And that is something that you can look at. That is in the, uh, that is in the, in the, what do you call it? The description. Okay. So AP Euro Salon Review, it is a small group. You know, it is something that it's the most expensive event that I offer this week, but it's because it's only capped at 25 people. Now, tomorrow night, I'll be doing an art review that's going to be less expensive that anybody can get in. You know, as many people as can get in there will get in there. I'll be putting some more information about that out tomorrow. Okay. Now, also, ladies and gentlemen, remember my Romulus app. Okay. So make sure that uh, Romulus stimuluseducation.com. Um, well, actually, you're not going to so much go to the website, um, but you're going to be looking uh, at the App Store or Google Play. Okay, so just a quick word from our sponsors before I start taking questions. I'm taking questions via Twitter, at Tom Ritchie, and then I'm going to be shouting out to new Instagram followers, also at Tom Ritchie. Now, Romulus is just a simple trivia app. You can go in, you're struggling with the topic, you can go in and you can say, hey, I want to look at the uh, Reformation of the religious wars. Okay. Now this one's actually got a thing from, uh, got a screenshot from the um, U.S. History app, but this is from the Age of Absolutism. It's a $2.99 app. It's something that if you're having trouble recalling specific knowledge, it certainly could not hurt you to get a hold of Romulus Euro. It's on the App Store and Google Play. You've got it on number three in education, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all so much. And remember, these are not stimulus-based questions. They're trivia questions, and they're designed just to reinforce basic content knowledge. There's nothing magical about the app. That's why it's $2.99. Give it a good review if you wouldn't mind, uh, if, you, if it's helpful to you. But it's basically reinforcing trivial knowledge. I put it together myself, and I think it's going to help not so much with the multiple choice, but more with the SAQ, the DBQ, the LEQ, where you have to recall stuff. Okay, so with that, ladies and gentlemen, um, that's a little word from our sponsor. Okay, so go ahead and support uh, Romulus Euro um, if you're up for it, ladies and gentlemen. So with that, uh, so the salon review will start at 10. That's a smaller group uh, kind of thing here. And we still got five spots for that. Let me go ahead and go to Twitter and let's see what we've got coming in from the questions. Okay. So as far as that, uh, we've got, yeah. So, uh, El Elodie, um, your man's. Okay. So there we go. And, uh, where are you? Yes. Yeah, so I am there. Sorry about the delay. Okay. So I've got several questions plucked right from the tree. Um, that is AP Euro. What happened before Napoleon took power? Um, Okay, so as far as that, we want to think about the phases of the French Revolution. So you've got like the kind of like liberal, moderate phase of the French Revolution, 1789, where their goal is a constitutional monarchy. Um, and so that kind of radicalizes as you've got that Jacobin element, okay? The Jacobin clubs, they were Republican, okay? Now, Republican, not like the party, but they favored Republicanism, a government that is not led by a king, okay? A government that is not led by a 
king that is a uh, Republican government. Okay, so they want to get rid of the monarchy. And of course, as the revolution radicalizes, you also see the civil constitution of the clergy, which subordinates the church to the state and the French nation. And so with that, um, we're getting into, uh, you know, the next phase. OK, the, so the radicalization leading to the reign of terror. Now, I've got a series on the French Revolution that hasn't quite gotten to Napoleon, but I plan to finish at some point. Um, but the reign of terror, that's uh, you want to make sure you understand Robespierre. Um, and he is the leader of this faction, of this faction of Jacobins that has taken over the government and is instituting the terror. That's when you've got the guillotines. Now, that's only a period of less than two years. Okay, so 1793, 94, that is this period of the reign of terror. And so from there, we go to the directory. So what happened before Napoleon took power? Uh, you know, what happened before Napoleon took power is that the directory was in power. Now, the directory was, uh, you know, was not a very strong, a very well-established government. And, uh, you know, there were a lot of people that were disillusioned with it. Abiciez and some other folks, they, they were like, you know what, this military guy, Napoleon, we think we can control him. So in 1799, we've got the coup d'etat, de, coup okay, that Napoleon takes over the government as, uh, as well. And so then, remember, Napoleon... His rule is divided between uh, the consulate and the empire. OK, so the consulate and the empire. Um, and then so we think about 1799 to 1804. So about a five year period where you have the consulate, where Napoleon is basically running the government uh, as first consul, but he hasn't proclaimed himself um, emperor. OK, so he hasn't yet proclaimed himself emperor, which he does in 1804. And we see the first French empire, OK, in 1804. And so then you go on to 1815. Now, once Napoleon is defeated, uh, you have the Bourbon Restoration. Uh, where Louis the 18th, remember Louis the 17th uh, died in prison. Louis the 16th son died in prison. So the king that comes back was Louis the 18th. And so the Bourbon Restoration is part of Metternich's conservative order um, that we see, uh, you know, taking place um, after the Napoleonic Wars. Okay, this 1815 to 1848, um, that this time is the age of Metternich, okay? The age of Metternich, this age of a European conservative order, okay? So from there, Let's go ahead and get over. Uh, can I go over the Crimean War? Now, the main thing we want to know is that uh, that the Crimean War was a modernizing war. OK, so when we look at the, uh, you know, the 1850s, which the Crimean War is really kind of the closest thing there is to a continental war between the Napoleonic Wars and World War One. So it's nearly a century of peace. And what happened here was Russia was trying to take advantage of Ottoman weakness, okay? The Ottoman Empire, by that time known as the sick man of Europe, um, is, you know, is receding and Russia's thinking we're going to go into Crimea, of course, kind of like what they're doing now, right? But the Russians are like, you know, we're going to go into Crimea and the British and the French are like, uh-uh, balance of power. And so the biggest thing there, if you read the Charge of the Light Brigade, Alfred Lord Tennyson's poem, cannon to the right of them, cannon to the left of them, cannon in front of them, volleyed and thundered uh, into the jaws of hell, you're into the mouth of hell, rode the 600, okay? And so with that, I mean, it's a great poem, but it goes into like, you know, there were some people that ordered a very like full hardy, uh, you know, cavalry charge, okay? A very full hardy cavalry charge. And what the British realized is that, you know, they can't, uh, you know, the British realized that you can't keep selling commissions. OK, so this is not very smart policy um, to sell commissions and they stop selling military commissions. So you start to see that the British military goes more in the direction of a meritocracy. OK, goes in more of a direction of a meritocracy, which if you've ever seen the movie Zulu, which uh, I highly recommend um, as a movie that kind of shows you uh, into imperialism, British imperialism. The two main characters are a, a, a middle aged uh, British officer that's from a more like middle class family. And then there's this younger, like aristocratic British officer that comes from the old guard. So the modernization there is important. And 
and you know that you've got all of these different technologies um, that are at play there. So the Crimean War, but mainly the impact on modernization. Okay, um, can I compare Louis the Fourteenth to Adolf Hitler? Um, I don't know if I've really ever tried to do that. Okay, so that is an interesting kind of thing there. Um, Louis the Fourteenth and Adolf Hitler. Thank you, Sophia. I don't know that I would really um, get into that now. Sophie's asking how enlightened was Napoleon. Okay, so as far as that goes, how enlightened was Napoleon? Um, I'm thinking in terms of a lot, really. You know, Napoleon a lot of times gets a bad rap. Uh, you know, people think of him as like a dictator, uh, which dictatorships are not all created equal, okay? That Napoleon really is conducting himself uh, very much uh, like the enlightened absolutist. When you think about that an enlightened absolutist uh, is about religious toleration, um, you know, first of all, so when we think about Napoleon's concordat, Napoleon's concordat is about, you know, I mean, you see that the Catholic Church is recognized as the quote-unquote majority religion in France, okay? The quote-unquote quote, majority religion, um, the Catholic Church. And so from there, uh, you know, that you can be whatever religion you want. So the Catholic Church after Napoleon is, and during and after Napoleon, is not the state religion. It's not the official religion. But Napoleon realizes that this is the religion that the people want. And people ask, why did the French accept Napoleon? Napoleon always placed, uh, you know, himself in the same boat as the nation. I'm actually reading a biography of Marshal Ney, one of Napoleon's Napoleon's uh, you know, marshals, one of his right hand men. And Napoleon, when he comes back, when he escapes from Elba, he makes this proclamation that uh, the tricolor, you know, our national colors, you know, the eagle and the tricolors will fly from every steeple all the way to Notre Dame. Uh, that, you know, he says that my fortunes are your fortunes. And, you know, the thing is that Napoleon identified himself with the people. It's not the same kind of like dictatorship when you think about like 20th century totalitarianism that Napoleon had legitimate elections called these plebiscites where people voted for him and he, you know, they voted to support his constitutions um, to the extent that his government was constitutional. And so, with that, that you see that Napoleon, he's also investing in education, um, the Napoleonic Code, that there is one system of laws, a single system of laws for France. And so not even Louis the Fourteenth. OK, um, we've got one more slot at the uh, Salon Review, small group Salon Review, if anybody's interested in that. There is one more slot, it looks like. And so as far as that, looking forward to that small group review. And so with Napoleon, that's uh, that's what we have to we have to keep in mind that, you know, not only did he make people feel great about being French, but, you know, Louis the 14th said one king, one law, one faith. And Louis was not ever able uh, to do one law. OK. And so Napoleon, you know, is the one that's able to unite France and he's able to, you know, to make people identify with him. OK. And so that's something that is very important about Napoleon, that he made people proud of the nation. OK. So, uh, you know, as far as that, that's something that, you know, really like we think about the French Revolution is not just about liberalism, but also about nationalism. And I don't think that Napoleon was was completely illiberal when you look at the concordat where it's like, look, the Catholic Church is the religion of the, of the majority, but we are going to tolerate all religions. And then the whole idea of the Napoleonic Code, which made everyone equal under the law, um, that there are several things here that, yeah, that I think Napoleon has a great deal in common with the enlightened absolutist. Uh, so definitely, I mean, I'm actually, I'm, you know, you can tell I, I'm a big fan of Napoleon. I think that he was, uh, you know, he was somebody um, that for his time, I think, uh, I think was great. Um, so as far as that kind of stuff, uh, Sophia, the tithes. Okay. So while we're on the French revolution, which I enjoy talking about the French revolution, um, while we're on that, uh, so we've got, uh, we've got some folks, uh, you know, asking good questions on Twitter and I am going to also be occasionally shouting out to new Instagram followers. Instagram is also at Tom Ritchie. Um, so let me just go ahead and just, uh, say here, um, Sio Hanku, um, Sess Sachs, uh, 26. 
Kate Poyd, um, Catherine Reddy, um, Aiden, uh, Jay Weaver. We've got uh, Jonathan B and Lily McGovern and Donovan, Don Donovan. Okay, that's an interesting thing. Aaron J99. Thank you for the Instagram follows, ladies and gentlemen. And y'all have got an opportunity um, to uh, to double tap Harambe for a five, right? Uh, we want to make sure. Now, also, um, I'm thinking that uh, some people in some other reviews have been using this term, let's get this break. So I'm thinking that for our AP European European history exam um, that uh, you write. Now the trick is, okay, so what you do when you're taking your exam just for fun, when you're writing your DBQ or LEQ, just somewhere on the paper, write, let's get this bread and cross it out. Now when you cross it out, the readers cannot grade it, okay? So if you write down, let's get this bread. You know what, actually, when y'all are you know what? Y'all go ahead and when you ask me questions on Twitter, go ahead and hashtag let's get this bread. How do y'all like that? We're going to say let's get this bread, which now we're talking about the French Revolution, right? Let's get this bread. Let that, you know, they don't have any bread. Let them eat cake, right? So let's get this bread. That's what we're thinking about here. And Nationwide, Ellis Gabby, Sam Webb 8, uh, Book Nerd 13. We've got uh, Harry Hilton and Emily Reynolds. Thank y'all so much. Uh, and Lexi Cohn, um, thank you for that. Okay, so Darren too. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, our phrase for the exam this year, let's get this bread, okay? And that's really whatever that bread is, go get it. Whether that bread is a three, a four, or a five, let's get this bread. Okay. How do y'all like that? Y'all let me know, but remember as you're asking questions, hashtag AP Euro, hashtag let's get this bread. Let's see if people are uh, doing that. Or, all right. There you go. Bevan Watson. Okay. Um, what was it? Was the Catholic Reformation successful? Can you elaborate on what happened in the Catholic Reformation? So let's get this bread, ladies and gentlemen. And so with that, um, the Catholic, you know, which is called, you know, the Counter-Reformation, sometimes called the Counter-Reformation, sometimes the Catholic Reformation. And it's something that, oh, I love seeing the bread emojis in the chat. That's great. Okay, let's get this bread, ladies and gentlemen. And so with that, it's kind of got a nuance here because the Counter-Reformation, you tend to think in terms of just running counter to the Reformation, against the Reformation. Let's put the Reformation down, that sort of thing. Okay, but the Catholic Reformation is more than that. So counter-reformation, it's not just against the Reformation, but there is, as Newton would say, an equal and opposite reaction, okay, to the Reformation. And so as far as that goes, uh, that, you know, when you think in those terms, that uh, you know, the Counter-Reformation is also, um, you know, in the Council of Trent. So the Council of Trent, okay, first of all, affirmation of Catholic doctrine, okay, that Catholic doctrine's not going to change one iota, but reformation of church practice. So let's stop selling indulgences, okay? Um, let's uh, let's train priests in seminaries. Let's do something to combat corruption in the church, okay? So those are some things that we want to that we want to make sure um, in terms uh, in terms of that, okay? That we want to think about that they're not changing doctrine, but they are, uh, you know, modernizing church practices and dealing with corruption in the Catholic church. Also the establishment of new religious orders. Okay. Like, uh, you know, the Jesuits, uh, with Ignatius Loyola or Teresa of Avila. Now, remember, we also want to associate Baroque art with the counter reformation. Now I'm going to get more into art, ladies and gentlemen, at 10 PM tomorrow evening, 10 PM Eastern, I'll have a premium session where we're going to be focusing specifically on art. Okay. Yes. Remember that. Let's get this bread hashtag. Remember, that's what we're going to be writing on our exam this year. Let's get this bread. All right. So excellent. Excellent. Okay. Yes. Yes. Uh, Benjamin, you got a great tweet here. Um, what is the difference between the French Revolution, and the Glorious Revolution? Now, that was an LEQ last year. Okay. But first of all, you've got to know a good bit about both of those revolutions. Okay. First of all, when they both happen, um, that the glorious revolution, um, really they're kind of bookends of the enlightenment. If you think about it, that that's been a DBQ topic before that evaluate the extent to which the glorious revolution was part of the enlightenment, you know, that the glorious revolution kind of built a bridge between the reformation and the enlightenment. Um, whereas, uh, the French revolution is almost 
almost like, you know, maybe Napoleon's kind of like a capstone uh, for the Enlightenment, something that is, uh, you know, something that is, uh, you know, kind of completing it, okay, when you look at it, uh, when you look at it that way, okay, so going from, uh, going from there that we think about the glorious revolution was, you know, much more understandable to us, right, that the end result was constitutional monarchy. Now, this is something that the French, at first, the French were very inspired, like the revolutionaries um, at the Estates General, they were thinking in terms of let's copy this, um, but then when we think about that the glorious revolution was more Locke, okay? That's more John Locke, that we're setting up this constitutional government to protect natural rights, that the French Revolution enter Rousseau, okay? And Rousseau was, uh, you know, in the social contract, Rousseau writes about the general will. And so the French Revolution is really about the nation, okay? So when you think about, like, the British. It's more about the glorious revolution is about the people protecting their liberties. Okay. So when we look at Locke's social contract, it's very individualistic. Whereas Rousseau's social contract is more, well, social. It's more, you know, kind of proto-socialistic because Rousseau's talking about that the, the purpose of the social contract is not so much to protect individual rights as much as it is to, uh, as much as it is to, uh, you know, to protect the nation, to make sure the general will is something that is uh, that is seen here. And that's something we see in a lot of like Jacques Louis David's paintings, um, such as the oath of the Horatia or the death of Socrates, where we see people that they are laying down their own will um, because they are part of the nation. And that's something that we really don't necessarily see in the Glorious Revolution. Now, in both cases, you do have anti-clericalism as well, um, that the Puritans, remember, they were the ones who were against the Church of England, uh, whereas the, you know, the Jacobins, um, you know, later they are against the Catholic Church. And so you see like in the, you know, in the extreme phase of the um, English Revolution, okay? So when you think about the English Civil War, where you saw like the D, uh, Catholicizing of the Anglican Church for for a per for a brief period of time, and then when you look at uh, you know the French Revolution in the most extreme phase, you see dechristianization, and so. With that, let's go ahead and, uh, you know, see what else is coming out here. And let's see, do we have a few more? I'm sure we got a few more new Instagram followers. Might want to shout out. We've got uh, McKenna Kreider, Sarah Grise, um, Anna Grise. So it looks like we've got uh, got some sisters here. OK, so a shout out to Marple over here with, uh, you know, with a couple of siblings here. All right. And thank you so much for, uh, you know, we're even, uh, you know, liking things and liking uh, you double tap. Tarambe to try to get a five. Okay, hopefully that'll help you out. All right, so ladies and gentlemen, uh, you know, thank you so much for that. Okay, so, uh, you know, we'll go ahead and be, uh, you know, going out for um, those once in a while. Now, any uh, tips for remembering the differences between James the first, James the second, Charles the first, Charles the second. Okay. Now, the first thing is Remy. We need to think about in terms of putting them to get, together. So the first, you've got J1, C1 on one side, C2, J2. Now it creates like a mirror image. So imagine looking into a mirror. Uh, you know, now some people say, imagine a hand and Cromwell's the middle finger. But the thing is, the Jameses are on either side. Okay. And then the Charleses are in the middle and then there's Cromwell. So James the first, Charles the first, Charles the second, James the second. So remember kind of the mirror image of them. And then James the first and Charles the first, this is the period of Stuart absolutism. Okay, so absolutism is what you're seeing at that time. Now, then, uh, you know, you've got uh, going from Stuart absolutism to, of course, Cromwell and uh, the protectorate. But then after that, you've got the restoration. OK, so the restoration, of course, that's where you've got Charles II and James II. And you don't really have the same level of absolutism, um, but you do have, uh, you know, really that the monarchs are trying to, uh, you know, protect, they're still trying to fight with parliament. 
Act. Um, the Glorious Revolution was basically about how James II was not enforcing the Test Acts. Okay, the Test Acts were there to make sure that uh, that people who served in the British government were Protestant. Now, Charles the Charles the Second converted Catholicism on his deathbed. James the Second did not wait till it was time to die. Um, James the Second uh, converted, and he was an open. Catholic. Okay. So he was openly practicing um, Catholicism. And so with that, uh, you know, that's really what, but what I would think though, is the mirror image that you've got the first on one side, the second on the other, the Jameses are on the outside and the Charleses are on the inside. Okay. And it looks like our AP Euro salon review tonight has filled up, but what I'll probably do is once that concludes, I'll just, uh, I'll put the price down to like five bucks. So it's, if there's anybody that just wants to watch it, um, I will, I will put a deep discount on the price um, once that is uh, once that's concluded, which it'll conclude sometime before midnight Eastern tonight. So if you're interested in that, once it concludes, uh, it'll be the same link, but I'll make the price five dollars uh, rather than um, the current price. That's more for that small group session. All right. So uh, so going in that. Oh, my goodness. Did Oliver Cromwell just call me a sellout? Uh, you know, that is uh, that's interesting. Oliver Cromwell. There's a guy that never sold out. Out, right. Okay. I tell you what, y'all, uh, y'all get in some interesting stuff here and thinking and speaking of selling stuff, remember um, Romulus Euro. Okay. That's uh, that's a helpful app. Just two ninety nine, dollars ladies and gentlemen. All right. So going with that, okay, so, um, you know, as far as that goes, can I go over what you think we need to know about the post-Cold War time period, okay? So as far as just getting in a few things that I think are important, I would say, first of all, the Marshall Plan, okay? So we want to understand the Marshall Plan, the European Recovery Plan, which is trying to um, get, uh, you know, the Marshall Plan is money to Western European countries uh, so that we can help them rebuild and so they don't become communist because then they'll lose American money. So the United States, which was the largest, uh, you know, which which is the, you know, the largest country that was involved in the European war, uh, then expresses an interest all of a sudden in being involved because of the policy of containment of communism. And so we see there that um, we go from uh, we go from from there um, to the Marshall Plan that we're trying to like look we're trying to basically make sure that they don't become communists. Then NATO, okay, NATO, which becomes a permanent uh, you know a permanent alliance um, between the United States, Canada, and Western European countries. Also note that NATO expanded significantly after the fall of the Soviet Union. So we see now that NATO is actually Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, which were actually part of the Soviet Union, are in NATO. Poland's in NATO. Um, Czech, the Czech Republic and Slovakia, most of the Eastern Bloc countries are currently today in NATO. Now, then the Brezhnev Doctrine, of course, is important and associating that with the Prague Spring. Um, Mikhail Gorbachev and his reforms of Glasnost and Perestroika, which these were designed, remember, to try to save the communist system, but uh, ended up kind of, uh, you know, exposing it for what, uh, you know, what a farce it was and accelerating its downfall. Um, so then we would go, go on some other things that I would note uh, Thatcherism, okay? Thatcherism is something that I've seen come up on exams before and specifically Thatcher's, uh, you know, Thatcher's tough line toward labor unions, okay? Like Thatcher was very tough on labor unions, uh, of course, before she came in, they had what was called the winter of discontent. And that was when, you know, it was a very unusually cold winter and it was filled with strikes. And public opinion can only tolerate unions to such a, you know, such a point where the unions are not, uh, you know, where the strikes are not uh, getting in the way of people living their everyday life. And so when you see a you know, when you see the the strike going on, it's like, look, people aren't taking out my garbage and it's cold outside and all of that kind of stuff. Margaret Thatcher comes in at that time. Now, also, Margaret Thatcher was uh, very much into uh, economic liberalism. Now, remember when we're talking about economic liberalism in European history, we're always talking about deregulation, low taxes, uh, that a, a preference for the private sector rather than public sector ownership of the means of 
production. Okay, so those are some things that you want to make sure to know. Also, European integration. So when we think about the European economic community and, of course, the formation of the European Union um, after, uh, you know, after the fall of communism um, in the early 90s. And another thing that I think that is going to become increasingly important, uh, that one of the themes of the AP Euro course is European and national identity. So how is it that national identity continues to be a force in Europe, even in the face of the European integration, and specifically um, in the sense what we call Euroscepticism. So when you look at Brexit, for example, and uh, what's going on with that, and also some of the countries in Europe that are resisting some of the policies of the European Union. So what place do nations have in, you know, in today's Europe? Uh, Danielle, I will note that the, uh, that the that the Hundred Years War concluded before 1450, and you're not going to see that on the exam, okay? That, that really the Hundred Years War is really typically taught at the beginning of an AP Euro course just to kind of establish some context, okay? So I would I would not uh, worry about the Hundred Years War. The Thirty Years War, definitely. The Hundred Years War, not so much, okay? Um, so uh, let's see, uh, Elodie is still, uh, I tell you what, Elodie, you've been uh, you've been interacting so much, you get a follow, okay? Um, is watching you shout them out. Emily, Hannah, Melina, Amanda, Gab, Anna, and a few more. Uh, gosh, for those of you who are a few more, I want to give a special shout out to you. Okay, she didn't give me your name, but at the same time, you know, there we go. All right, so uh, some important women in Western civilization. Uh, now, you want me to shout out to your Euro class, first period, Mr. Rubina's, we love you, question mark. Okay, so as far as some important women in European history, I would say, first of all, Mary Wollstonecraft. Um, that she was the first like popularizer of uh, of feminism and specifically liberal feminism, which is on the on the model of natural rights. So first, Mary Wollstonecraft wrote a uh, vindication of the rights of man. She wrote a book to defending the French Revolution and the liberal values of the French Revolution, especially the early French Revolution, not so much the terror, but the early French Revolution. Now, then she wrote a vindication of the rights of woman. So first of all, I've demand, I've, I've, you know, defended uh, the equality of men. And now let's talk about the equality of women. Uh, and so she's really the first one to popularize this. Now, I've got a series on women and the French Revolution. And one of the videos in that series is about Mary Wollstonecraft and Edmund Burke. OK, so it's about Wollstonecraft and Burke. And of course, Burke was a an opponent of the French Revolution. Now, I've got, uh, you know, also Charlotte Corday and uh, Marie Antoinette and Olympe de Gouges, who was the author of the Declaration of the Rights of Woman and the female citizen. Uh, Olympe de Gouges, who was beheaded uh, during the terror, not for writing that, but because she was a Girondin. And so with that, those are a few there. Now, I would also uh, note uh, Emmeline Pankhurst, who was a suffragette. She's somebody who, who makes great outside information. Um, also, Simone de Beauvoir, who uh, after World War II published The Second Sex. Now, one thing that you want to understand is the difference between what we call first wave feminism and second wave feminism. Now, first wave feminism, that is that is starting with the French Revolution with Wollstonecraft and leading up to World War One. OK, that they're looking for political rights. They're looking for voting rights. Um, also, some things like owning property, like a married woman being able to own property. Uh, child support, that was another thing that uh, was a problem back then, um, that a man who had a child with a woman he wasn't married to had no legal obligation to support those, you know, to support that child or those children. Um, so, you know, the first wave feminism um, culminates with World War One. okay, that basically uh, during and after, you know, a little bit before some countries, like I think Finland, technically women's suffrage a little before World War I, but during and after World War I is when most Western countries uh, recognize the right of women to vote. Now, 
then women achieved political equality, but they didn't achieve you know, economic and social equality. They still didn't have access to the professions. When you think about law, medicine, academia, um, they still were not, uh, you know, were not uh, given equality in the workplace. And so after World War II, you see the advent of second wave feminism. Now, of course, uh, Simone de Beauvoir was an existentialist feminist. A feminist. Um, so she wasn't a feminism, but she was a feminist. OK. And so with that, you know, when we look at second wave feminism, we're looking for, uh, you know, equal access to education in the workplace, equal pay birth control, okay, which of course uh, with birth control that gave women uh, the ability to plan a family so that they weren't, you know, so that they could have a career. Uh, without birth control, very difficult for a woman to have a career. All right. Oh, it looks like somebody gave me uh, five dollars. Okay. Ninja feedback. Shout out to Mrs. Matthews, six period. Um, if y'all want to do a super comment, I will keep an eye on this stuff. Okay. So I'll keep an eye on this stuff. So ninja feedback, shout out to Miss Matthews, sixth period. I don't know if Oliver Cromwell is going to call me a sellout again for that, but if you, you know, hey, if you want to, you know, if you want to support my work like that, I am so appreciative. Nate Marshall, uh, one dollar, and I don't know. Uh, let's see. So the top chats, uh, you know, I just want to make sure that we've got those top chats. Um, so with that. Ladies and gentlemen, we've got a Thomas Cromwell in the chat too. That chat looks very interesting. All right. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, um, we've already, okay. So Yash, we already did a little bit uh, of Margaret Thatcher. Um, Maria, give a shout out to Miss Jones, AP European history class from Spanish River, River Community High School in Boca Raton, Florida. Okay. So, uh, so definitely glad to, uh, glad to see y'all there. And, uh, when Nelson 2021, thanks for the like spam, I suppose. Uh, yours truly Jojo and Jocelyn B and Nate Cohen. Thank y'all so much for the Instagram follows. All right. So with that, I tell you what, we're having a, a good time here. Um, so Okay, Mr. Orozco, second period. Um, why was Hitler? Okay, I thought that uh, the question was, was Hitler anti Semitic? Um, why was Hitler anti Semitic? Now, Hitler, I've got a three part video on YouTube about the rise of Hitler. Um, so, y'all might want to, uh, you know, y'all might want to make a little note of that. That video is out there. Um, Hitler grew up in, uh, in Austria, which uh, was, uh, you know, very much like there was an anti Semitic party uh, that was very powerful in Austria when Hitler was young. And so Hitler absorbed a lot of this, also absorbed pan-Germanism. Because remember that Bismarck wanted to unify uh, Germany on the basis of Prussian dominance. So he excluded Austria. So pan-Germanism is this idea, you know, that original Grossdeutschland, greater Germany, bigger Germany. Okay. So that's what we're, that's what we're looking at there. And so, you know, Hitler absorbed uh, anti-Semitism and uh, pan-Germanism in his youth. And of course, that was something else as far as after World War I, uh, you know, they had this whole like stabbed in the back, uh, you know, thing where, you know, because there were, you know, some Jews that were involved, a handful of Jews involved in a communist movement um, that was, you know, happening in 1918, uh, you know, to try to undermine the government. There's this idea that there's like this huge Jewish conspiracy that the Bolsheviks and the Jews are all conspiring together to bring down Germany. And Hitler, of course, absorbed some of that propaganda uh, as well. But I've got a video on the rise of Hitler. Um, shout out to Dylan Wallace 01 on Instagram. All right. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, uh, now let me uh, just remind y'all again, the Romulus Euro app is on the App Store and Google Play. As I'm saying, it's $2.99. It's, it's not going to work miracles, but it's a little trivia app that should be able to help you with just, you know, and you can use it anywhere. Our, one of our uh, hashtags is prepare now. So no matter where you are, if you're sitting there waiting to take your exam on Wednesday morning, you know, you can sit there on the app. It's very easy to use. Now, stimulus-based questions, no, but it's just you need to have that knowledge reinforced. You don't need to just be sitting there when you take the exam and like, wait, what was that again? Um, the treaty of what, you know, so you have treaty of what the treaty of whoa, you know, like, uh, you know, they taught me on Instagram live how to do the whoa. It's like, Ugh, you know, something like that. I got to do something in my head that. All right. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, um, Vladimir Lenin, his ideas. Now, one thing that I'll, that I'll note here, Seth, about Vladimir Lenin, um, is that 
Lenin, uh, you know, kind of went, uh, you know, against uh, some things as far as, uh, you know, as far as Marx. OK, like Marx said that the communist revolution was going to happen spontaneously, um, that that was going to happen spontaneously. And so with that. Um, you know, Lenin actually was like, look, we're going to have a violent revolution, um, you know, just like Marx said, but the violent revolution needs to be led by somebody. OK, the violent revolution needs to like the working class. Marx said that the working class would independently uh, develop a sense of class consciousness. Lenin's like not so much. OK, not so much there um, that the working class is not going to develop a sense of class consciousness independently. OK, so that's not something that's going to uh, that's going to happen uh, there that they need some help. And so Lenin was, you know, bringing in this uh, revolutionary vanguard, this revolutionary cadre that's going to make this happen. OK, uh, Joy, I would definitely recommend, uh, you know, the second industrial revolution. I've got a video on the second industrial revolution where I compare the first and second industrial revolution. But, you know, you know what, since you asked so nicely, um, let's go ahead and just take a quick look look at that and what you would see in that video. So I'm going to go ahead and screen share here. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and screen share. And let's see. So let's go ahead and just talk about real quick the second industrial revolution. OK, so first of all, we want to know when they're happening. So the first industrial revolution, late 18th century, early 19th century, and we're moving from hand power to machine power, um, whereas the mass production, we're talking about textiles. All right. So we're getting into textile production, water, coal and steam. OK, now note the steam engine still around in the second industrial revolution, but it's being, uh, you know, it's, it's invented there in the first industrial revolution. So the steam engine is the new engine of the first industrial revolution. And again, we're on textiles, the spinning jenny, water frame, spinning mule, and of course the cotton gin. Um, and remember that when we think about the cotton gin or the spinning jenny, it's more about these rotary powered hand cranked engines or what we're seeing there. OK, the standard of living for the working class was pretty awful. Now, the second industrial revolution is after 1850 um, that we see here the. Uh, the time frame here, it really starts with the Crystal Palace, which was the first World Expo. OK, and so we see here, I tell you what, when Nelson is make, is liking a lot of pictures there on Instagram, Hannah Fay, Ash Courier, Falcon and uh, Wesley, one in or whatever, Claire Crowder. Thank you all so much for your support. Now, the second industrial revolution is really about increased automation. So not just hand power to machine power, but increased automation and the mass production. We're moving into steel the Bessemer process, which is something that you also learn in a push. And so power sources, we're going to petroleum and electricity and new engines. We're seeing the internal combustion engine, which is the same engine that you've got in your car. If you've got a gasoline powered engine um, the internal combustion engine, automobiles, chemicals, railroads, the railroads become prevalent. There are a few railroads during the first industrial revolution, but before the Bessemer process, you really couldn't mass produced steel and telegraph telephone radio. Now, as far as the second industrial revolution, if it was used in World War One, then you can put it there. OK, because when you think about that, uh, then you're seeing, OK, well, this World War One is like kind of the capstone of the second industrial revolution. And so the standard of living for the working class still bad, but improving. We're seeing some uh, some developments in public health, sewer, sanitation and also um, an expansion of of the middle class. Not a great time to be poor, but then again, when is a great time to be poor? And so as far as that rhetorical question, ladies and gentlemen, I don't really expect that to be answered. All right. So with that, uh, we are kind of, uh, you know, I've got my 10 o'clock session here, but I'm going to be, I'm going to be back. Okay. On um, the war of the Spanish succession. Remember, I've got a video on that. Remember, I've got a playlist, ladies and gentlemen, I'm on YouTube. Now also just a couple things as I'm closing up. Okay. Remember,
remember, uh, you know, if you want to get a hold of the Romulus app, I'd certainly recommend it. But then again, that's point of view me. Uh, if you find it helpful, give it a good review. Some people don't really get it. They think, oh, these aren't stimulus based questions. They're not supposed to be. OK, they're not supposed to be stimulus based. Now, the other thing is if you go to tomritchie.net slash euro, um, you can sign up for my email list, making sure that you're getting notifications of the events going on tomorrow. OK, so you can sign up for my AP students email list. Um, that's something that you can look at there. Now, also, so remember, like I said, uh, the um, the, you know, so sign up for the email list if you'd like so you can get notifications the next couple days. I'll let you know what I'm doing and everything. Uh, remember that the salon review, I'll deep discount that as soon as it's over to five bucks. If anybody, you know, especially if you're on the West Coast or you want to look at it tomorrow, I will be back tomorrow at nine o'clock p.m. for another public broadcast. I will also be doing the annual Breakfast with Richie broadcast at 9 a.m. all times Eastern. Okay. So at 9 a.m., I'm going to to be uh, doing the Breakfast with Richie broadcast. And that's going to be a two and a half hour broadcast. That's like 9 a.m. to almost 1130. OK, so that's going to be a pretty lengthy broadcast. A lot of people like to eat breakfast. If you're on the West Coast, uh, I'll be talking when you wake up. OK, so I'm looking forward to this. But again, I'll be back at 9 p.m. tomorrow. Now, if you want to be in the 8 p.m. session, go to fiveable.me slash plus, and then you can put in um, Tom Ritchie as the promo code, all one word, if you want to get a hold of a uh, fiveable plus. OK, um, so with that, uh, you know, I've already done a Brexit broadcast. There's some interesting stuff here in the chat. So, ladies and gentlemen, I will see you again at nine o'clock tomorrow. Um, thank you, Miguel and Captain Suge uh, for the uh, for the top chats there for, uh, you know, getting uh, you know, yeah, y'all, some people are donating and stuff. That's uh, that's very nice of y'all. I sure appreciate it. All right. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to close this off, but I will be back 9 p.m. on Tuesday night and 9 a.m. on Wednesday morning, all times Eastern. So thank y'all so much, ladies and gentlemen, for joining me this evening. And I look forward to helping you out some more as we prepare for the exam. It's always a pleasure.